Hey, may I speak to Dave, please? I'm not here right now, but please leave a message. Leave it clear. And if you're an interview, keep talking, because I am here. Oh, hey, Dave. <laughs> this is David Sheridan. Hello. Hey, is, it, <laughs> is, this, is this really you? This is. Okay. Yes, how are you, man? Excellent, excellent. My name is my name is Jesse Hobson. I'm with uh, Cinedum dot com. That that right. that was that was impressive, man. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to do movie phone. Does that guy even exist anymore? I don't. I don't think so. I don't think so, You're man. Like, thank you for calling movie phone. <laughs> <laughs> Dude, I, <laughs> that's the best intro I think I've ever had, and I've been I've been doing this for a while, so I I definitely commend you for. <laughs> oh, thanks, man. I don't know. That was just spur of the moment. I do everything spur of the moment. You know what I mean? So I'm actually shocked. Hold on. Yeah, you were like in 1201. That was pretty good. Yeah, uh, man. It was like because I was about to. I just got a paint mixer in my hand, like a little, you know, one of those wooden things that you mix paint up with. Yeah. Uh, so I'm in the backyard, like working on some, uh, some, some of like what is this stuff called, like barn wood. Yeah. Just barn with looking stuff, so I got these stains and stuff and milk paints and crap like that. Well, I won't and take I won't take too much of your time, man. I just I actually oh yes no no take my time. My time is is worthless at this point. <laughs> I'm joking. Say your name again. My name is Jesse, like a lady. Jesse, and and what's the what's the dot com? It's it's Cinedump, like uh, cinema, but Cinedump dot com. Yeah, Cinedump. Wow, we, I, you know I made it when I. I'm really working my way down. So, I, I, can I tell my parents, you got to check out the interview. It's on Cinedump. Yeah. Right. I'll tag them. Really? I'll tag you. Like, that way everyone <laughs> will know. The whole family will know. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from oh, Houston, oh. Texas, man. Houston, yeah. So, then you certainly are. You are the armpit and Cinedump at the same time. <laughs> um, uh, no, because of Houston being in the southern region, I would say it's sort of like... Uh, Somewhere in the left testicle crotch area, I guess. Because uh, uh, Gary, Indiana is the armpit of the nation. And, and Gary, Indiana should be the sister city to Houston. It really should, because they both have their moments of smell. Um, and and, uh, and they're both in the industry of chemicals. You guys are more of the oil side of things, refineries and stuff like that. But you both have a body of water. They have the... Uh, you know, the, the, the Great Lakes or whatever, Lake Erie, I think, is up there. Yeah, my, my dad actually works in, in oil. He works in, uh, like, downtown, and then he works in Pasadena, which is, like, a um, on the outskirts. And, and yeah. you, you hit the nail on the head. It, it, it smells so bad. It's to the point where, like, it's known for how bad Pasadena smells. Yeah, that's the thing. I've never actually been there, but I just... That's what I've heard, so, and I can I can imagine it does. You know, but maybe not at all times, right? No, like, at all you know, times, man, all times. Really? All, because the chemicals are burning good. all day. So yeah, that can't be good. No, that can't be good. Oh, yeah, yeah, rents rents like uh, super low, cost of living super low, especially in that part of it. So yeah, yeah if if you well, live, cost of living, cost of living low because you won't be living long. It's like that. Yeah, cost of living. You know what? Like, Give yourself a goddamn jet ski right now. <laughs> Do a little water well, sun show, do the oil slicks, and light it on fire. It's like, you'll be, uh, you'll have some sort of growth coming out of your skin, I guess, by the time you're 56, you know? So. Yeah, it's it's pretty horrible. But, I mean, you have my number now, so if you ever want to visit the great area of Pasadena, uh, Phil, I, I, again, I don't live there. I live I actually live on lakes in, in yeah. near Houston, so we can actually, we can actually yeah. go jet skiing where I where I live. Oh, nice. <laughs> yeah, you know, I have friends from L.A. move out there with their family, and I forget what the, the dad did for a living. I think he was in banking, actually, but they got a nice, you know, I mean, like, it, it certainly does not cost, the cost of living is affordable. And they got a, you know, they got a pretty nice place, and I don't think they were hit on the flood slash hurricane. Wasn't there something recently, maybe in the last couple of years? Yeah, yeah, we had one about a year and a half ago. It was, it was actually pretty, pretty bad, man. Like, uh, it was the same year that the Astros like won the the championship, so it kind of kind of worked out. Like, <laughs> yeah, it took, yeah, it, took, it like kind of like now people don't remember the Astros winning so much. Like, yeah. Didn't they win? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, but my TV floated away that year, so I couldn't, you know, 
couldn't see it. But there are these pines. I think there's like these pine barrens between somewhere between Houston and, and, and Austin. There's some sort of like pine barren area that I want to go visit at some point. Yeah, Austin. Austin's definitely uh, the place to visit. Uh, I would like. I have friends that live there, and I would say that it's more of like a novelty city. Like if if yeah. if you want to go like hang out, you know, kind of see the the art side of, of Texas, that would be where to go. But ultimately, I would def I would not recommend living there unless you're like Richard Linklater or you know someone that has ties to that area. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Te- yeah. Texas royalty yeah. type of area, I guess you could say. Exactly. Yeah, Sandra Bullock. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I've, met, I've, I've actually worked with Richard Linklater. Oh yeah. Times, so yeah. Would uh, I like him very. Which very project cool was that? Well, it's a project that never really got off the ground, but we were in pre-production, and it was called an El Camino Love Story. And this was 1999. Oh wow. Maybe even 98. Might have been around 98. Um, it was one of my first things I was doing. Um, and we were we were set to shoot it there in Austin, and uh, and it was a dimension film with the wine scenes, and it just. What happened in that film was it was a demolition derby movie, yeah. right? But it was an anti-hero demolition derby movie, and I wrote it along with Mike Judge, and um, and Terry Zweigoff was attached to direct it at one point. Richard Linklater was producing it, and uh, basically um, there was no demolition derby in the movie, but it was a demolition derby movie, like the third act, you know, dramatic. If there's a baseball movie, there's baseball, you know what I mean? Yeah, there's yeah. A, a gladiator movie, you know, there's going to be some gladiator third act thing, you know what I'm saying? So, like, the whole, like, big climax was, was supposed to be this demolition derby. That's what everything was built into with all the drama and all the Jeopardy beats and stuff like that. So there were cars involved and then the guys fixing cars up, you know what I mean? But, but the derby, uh, it just kind of, like, for our, for our anti-hero guy, and our man, at least, he never got there. You know, <laughs> he was a failure. It was a small movie. And that was the original thing. And that was, you know, that made the budget lower because he didn't have to shoot a bunch of cars and a bunch of stunts. And the wine scenes were like, no, no, no. We want, you know, there's got to be a, 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 a demolition derby. And why, he should be the Michael Jordan of it. He should transcend demolition derbies and be really good. And so they had a completely, right, a completely different movie for the third act, which had cars flipping in the air and the guy, you know, jumping cars and, you know, just completely uh, opposed to gravity. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. Like the stuff that they had to do. It. And next thing you know, it like quadrupled the budget of the movie. And <laughs> you're looking like that going, wait a second. Uh, yeah, we can't make this movie now. It's too expensive. And so it was like, I mean, it was right out of like cutting the slope or some sort of like the player or something like that. It was right out of like, you know, comedy there that the bosses, the ones that said, no, make it bigger, make it this, make it that, and then like, no, no, it's too big. Yeah. You can't make it. <laughs> like, well, why don't you just, I think we literally just take a meeting and say, can we go back to maybe making the original one, the one you liked the first place, and no, 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 I think we're going to move on. <laughs> like, wow, man, that's a, that's such a pain in the ass. But I, I mean, I've heard so many stories like that, and it, at the same time, I, it's, it's, as much as it sucks, it's good that it it's it ended before it started because that would have been just a fucking shit show had they changed their mind, you know, after you guys started filming like two thirds of the way in there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Exactly. We we did have sets built. People were cast. Um, you know, we had Amanda Plummer, Ashton Kutcher, myself, um, Bob. Bob, uh, the guy who played the warden in Shawshank Redemption, he was in a Bob something. Um, I forget his last name now. I, I think he's passed away. But anyway, it was, a, it, was a, it was a great cast. Shine McBride. Um, so they, everyone got <laughs> they, they have these things called pay or play deals. Yeah. So when you sign a contract with actors, you, you know, you might have to pay everything. They might make a deal where you're getting paid 50% if they cut you. You know what I mean? But yeah. you get, so money went that way, money for production studios, money for the set building and the art department. Because it was, you know, they were probably two or three weeks away from shooting. Oh, wow. We pulled the plug. So there was some, a lot of casting was involved and pre-casting. 
um, a scouting and getting the locations and stuff like that. So the guy's name was Bob Gunton. That's right. And yeah, yeah he's he's the father. He's definitely like yeah, a face everyone will recognize. Um, he's great. Yeah. Is he live? Uh, let's see. I'm kind of curious myself. Uh, let's see. I think he might have passed away. Uh, he's alive. Really? He's se- he's 73. Yeah. So that's yeah. He looks Bob. he looks good too. Yeah. He must be. Here's the thing. I don't watch a lot of TV. I don't watch a lot of TV. So he probably is in a TV show. I mean, as you got, I mean, an actor like that is probably like a regular on like something. Um, Deep or something. Yeah, you know I mean? yeah. yeah uh, he, he's, like, he's like someone's obsession right now that like we have no idea about. Yeah, the Flash. <laughs> yeah, you know, yeah. Agent Shield. Like, I know, you, you, there's so many TV shows. Do you agree that like it's just there's way too much content now? Yeah, when <laughs> it, it's it's really kind of, honestly, it's kind of a pain in the ass. Like because. Um, like I can, I can devote an evening to a movie or even two. Now, if someone sends me an entire series, like like so, like uh, I got sent, like you mentioned it, the, the Shield. I'm not gonna sit and watch an entire series of the Shield because you want a review on your your the new Blu-ray. You know what I'm saying? I might watch one episode um, here and there, or maybe even one. But I'm not. You know, you know there's there's just not enough time. You can't live right. and and then and allow someone into your living room every morning. That's just, or every day. That's just too much to ask. Right. And on top of that, as many shows as there are. Yeah, there's I mean, there, there, there's there's so Netflix, many. You know. So I mean, it's it's Google and Amazon and Netflix and then you know just all the content that they're already making and licensing and then all this independent stuff. And we're about to talk about an independent movie. Um, and then you got your studios and stuff, you know, yeah. and, all, and it's just, uh, it's overwhelming to me to, to, you know, stuff gets, stuff definitely gets lost through the cracks at the same time, um, the benefit to me as an actor, but I do more than an actor, I'm a writer, producer, director, but, and that's, the bad side of that is it gets your head spinning for me, I'm like, you know, it's just so much going on, it's like a, over, um, like a, Hyper, hyper, you know, I'm a hyperactive, so it's hyper sensitive. There's just too many spinning plates that can be in my face at one time yeah. now uh, because of so much uh, activities and uh, options. Uh, on the acting side, I've pretty much just stopped pursuing anything and just wait for friends or people to call me because it makes it a lot easier for me uh, to slow that down. But also, I know if somebody's calling me to be in something, then they're going to let me sort of do what I want to do. It's like, you have a little bit more leverage there. You know, my leverage on one side is a lot of it is independent movies, so clearly you're, they're, the budgets are lower, and that trickles down. They don't, you know, the actors don't get paid if the filmmakers don't have the wallet to, to make everything in the movie, you know what I mean? you got to put the money up on the screen, and you got to Make sure you have money for a car. If you have a car, it's supposed to pull up. You know what I mean? so, uh, but that just trickles down. You know, nobody sees the money in the wallet. They see the money on the screen. So you got to make sure you, know I mean? you got to make sure you can rent the house and have the head explode or whatever it is. That's where the money first goes. If there's anything left over, then then you can give people some money for cheeseburgers that you don't see on the screen because that's in people's stomachs and paying their rent. Yeah, but, uh, I, I get what you're saying. That makes that see but, like I'm also curious as to like a lot of times when it is a friend that calls or like someone that does reach out to you, hey, I wrote this part for you. I feel right. like I feel like ultimately that the film um like you can kind of from the viewer's perspective, you can kind of see that the actors are like, you know, the, the ultimate the end project is ultimately a better project because everyone was happy to work with everyone and and in a lot of cases anyway. Yeah, no, no, and that's what I was going to say, was by me kind of, like, putting myself in a, okay, I'll take calls versus make calls. I'm not going to chase a bunch of stuff around where if I get it, by proving myself, at the same time, you kind of want someone else's dime in the sense of um, you're a puppet. 
you're a puppet for hire. A lot of times when you're acting, you're a puppet for hire. There's strings attached because you're the puppet. Uh, and a director and other people, uh, producers of studio, want you to be a certain way. They want you to act a certain way. You don't get a lot of say. Uh, but when it's smaller projects and friends are calling and they say, I wrote the role for you, and, and, they, and they say, do, do your thing with Dave. Come and create what, how you want to play it. You know what I'm saying? Then there's a value in that from my perspective of being able to keep these performances that um, maybe I haven't been able to do. You know, like I kind of think that, like, okay, what I, haven't, what, I, what I haven't done yet. You know what I'm saying? Okay, I haven't played that kind of character yet. I haven't done that. Or I haven't been able to do like a really dark trauma yet. But this is great. I'm doing it. You know, you got it. I'm going to jump in full force. And, and I do agree with you. Like, we did a film. Uh, have you seen Victor Crowley? Yeah, I actually, I have, I have, I, I love it. I, <laughs> I have tons of questions about that in particular. It was, yeah, so that film, that, that film came out amazing. You know what I mean? I personally feel it's the best one of the the collection. Now, number one, I was always going to be number one, but I really feel like what transcended in that film, even though it's lacking in sort of, sort of like, uh, Locations because a lot of it takes place in the film, but it's a true ensemble movie. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. We really clicked as a cast, and that was something because, quite frankly, Adam was in a position of he, he didn't have a lot of money to make that one, so he, like you said, he wrote the roles going, Who is this punk? I want to work with Dave Sheridan. Wait, Dave would be great as this character. Let me, let me literally cater that character to work for everything Dave does, you know, in his little quiver of arrows of, of tricks and of his stuff, you know what I'm saying? So the Dylan character was just basically quintessential see Dave's run, you know what I mean? Like, oh, put Dave Sheridan in there and just let him go to his thing, you know what I'm saying? Um, it'd be like if you're writing a role for Andrew Dice Clay, you know what Andrew Dice Clay does. You see him do his thing a million times. Or Rodney Dangerfield, like in Back to School. Rodney Dangerfield was just Rodney Dangerfield let loose like a wild bull. Yeah. would be back to school, you know? So, um, and the same thing with like Felicia Rose and uh, a lot of the other, and almost every actor in there was just kind of like playing a hyper-extended version of what they do best, you know? Q from uh, uh, Pranksters, you know what I'm saying? It's just, I just thought, it, but it really worked out. And, and again, we had a great time in that show, just like what you were saying your point was, you know, hey, if, if the actors are working with friends and everybody's having a good time, they're doing a project they believe in, it sort of transcends itself into, uh, you know, a great film. So, so let's start the interview on your side, where now I'm uh, kind of, you got questions, I've got answers. Go sure, sure. So, yeah, let's just, let's jump in with, with uh, Victor Crowley. Um, so, I just want to confirm, so Adam did he did call you for that role, or like how? Like that's correct. Okay, excellent. And then um, Dylan, Dylan is like so over the top, and I immediately loved that character. Like something about it just really, really like hit hit home with me. And I was—is there anyone you modeled that performance after, or was that just something you kind of came up with on the fly, or did was Adam's did Adam's words kind of jump off the paper to you that way? Okay, so um, I think there might have been three or four different types of conglomerations that I threw into most of the stuff, but to, to, to take a step back, Adam called, hey, I'm making a movie. I can't tell you what it is, but I'm going to tell you what it is. It's, it's, it's the fourth installment of Patchett. But keep that a secret. We're going to make it a secret. And right away, the fact that he was going to try to make the movie under the under the radar yeah. without anyone knowing I was already in and he's like I wrote this character for you and I'm like awesome so give it a read and call me back ASAP and let me know if you're in and so I read just the opening two or three pages that I'm in you know what I mean and I called him right away I didn't even finish the script I'm like dude I'm in because you did make this character for me and I can see how it flows with what I do uh, and with that said, creating Dylan was obviously he's you know there's things written in the script. He's the wannabe actor guy. Um, I didn't write up those 
like when he's going through the impressions or handing out his headshots or resume. So all that's built into that. You know, obviously you take, when you build a character, you obviously take the stuff that's already signposted for the character right there and then, you know? And so, okay, Elvis, I was an actor, but you haven't seen the swamp, doing swamp tours, you know? And, um, and that's a big, but yet he really embellishes on those swamp tours. And so my son at the time, um, was really into his Jaws phase. And so one of the things, you know, he was doing was on YouTube because he's already watched all the Jaws movies. And he already watched all the Sharknado movies and Jerry Shark movies. But he was into watching just the Jaws tour rides that people shot with their phones at Universal Studios. He would watch hours and hours of these the same kind of tour, but with different tour guides, you know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, I watched those with him, and that's really where I kind of got the majority of the different things was, oh, wait a second, he's doing these swamp tours, you know what I'm saying? But I took it like, wait, he's a guy more like doing that Jungle Cruise tour or the Jaws tours, where he really makes it, you know, and he, that's where he gets his theater time. That's where his acting is, is on that little boat. You know what I mean? With his new costume. So that's kind of how I created that costume with the whole, uh, if you go and look at one of those Jaws tours of the riverboat, then you'll, you'll see my outfit is kind of very similar to one of those amusement park outfits that they would be wearing. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. that's, I'm kind of wearing the uniform there. In fact, when I got done shooting, we went to Universal Studios. They didn't have the Jaws right at the one in, um, in LA anymore and I think they might have just recently retired it in Universal Studios in Florida I hope they didn't because my son really wants to get on that someday how, but, how old um, is your son? now he's uh, I think he's 11 he just turned 11 ok yeah but awesome man. Yeah. perfect maybe, maybe perfect time to take him yeah he might have been 8 during this period um, but either way the Jurassic Park the, the the Jurassic Park ride, which is really a roller coaster. No, it's a flume ride. It's a flume ride at, at uh, Universal Studios. The guys, they wear the exact same outfit that Dylan's wearing. I'm talking like the, the blue shirt, the tan vest, the moon tag, and the actual, like, um, a scarf. Yeah. A scarf, which I think is what I got from Sam, uh, Sam, whatever his name is, from the original Jurassic Park. Yeah. He had that. Start thing. Um, so, you know, I put the outfit together. Um, and a lot of times for me, when you get it, when I get on set and I have the outfit and the hair and the look and stuff, then naturally a lot of that physicality then feeds back into how I'm going to play the character. I would say also um, with the film, and you know the ending, and you know where Dylan kind of goes, I just took a kind of like a Bruce Campbell vibe, I was like, oh, okay, I want this to be sort of like, because I am somewhat the hero in the movie, I don't want to give away to people, but, um, so I want, I was like thinking of like great, like, machismo of horror movie heroes and I was like, okay, Bruce Campbell uh, I'm going to give give a little bit of that in there, and um, and then like a little bit of uh, Matthew McConaughey not Matthew McConaughey is like uh not in his acting or the way he sounds, but just in that kind of sort of like machismo, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Dylan, Dylan Walk is fake walk, but it really, the best part about the Dylan character, what Adam pitched me and what we wanted to bring to me, the thing was, he was that kind of guy when you first meet him where you just go, oh, this guy's dead. Oh, he's so dead. <laughs> you know what I mean? I can't wait for him to get killed and to be in this sort of jerky yeah, I wouldn't say I'm an asshole, but I was just this idiot, you know, cocky, sort of like, jerk sort of dude, but not a jerk in a mean way, but just like, oh, this guy is so getting killed. Yeah. And the guy's like, hey, we're over here, we're over here, and I'm like, I'll go out and get it, and look outside, you know what I mean? Like, all the stuff that go, here's where he's gonna get it, here's where he's gonna get it, oh, he's gonna get killed here, you know what I mean? But he never does, you know what I'm saying? It's like, every little turn, you think this is when Dylan gets it. Like, when I'm in the cockpit and, and, and Victor Crowley finally comes in, it's like, oh, Dylan's going to get in here. He's alone with Victor Crowley. But he doesn't get me, you know what I mean? <laughs> like, so, 
I thought that was the sort of like I wouldn't say it was a um, you know I would call it like a misdirect, not a bait and switch, but we did misdirect the audience because I mean any of you agree with me because I don't know if you knew the ending or was tipped off or what, but if you're watching it, do you get a sense of, like Dylan's eventually going to get it? You know, like they. Yeah, I, ha I had no idea that was coming, and I would probably label it as more of, like, good writing, because if if you right. if you can make an audience feel that way, then, and you ultimately deliver something else, and they're still happy about it, I just think ultimately that's just, that's just good work. Yeah, exactly, and that's the thing, is he, you know, my character, probably more than anyone else in the entire film, probably has the biggest sort of arc in a change of when you first meet the guy and then what he is at the end. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Yeah. Because obviously Victor Crowley's the same. He's a homicidal demon maniac and a lot of the other characters have that same id, whether it's Andrew or, uh, you know, um, what was the lead, the lead, what was her character's name? Um, Rose. Yeah, that's right. You know, she's kind of this, she plays a very similar to that. She has a little bit of change, but, uh, you know, my character is one thing when you first meet him, and he's, at the very end, he's completely coming from a different place in his, his heart. So, his it does sort of change. So, I really like that film. Yeah, I, I, I thought it came out great. Yeah, we, we actually went and saw it at, like, one of the uh, tour shows, and I was uh, I was very, very pleased with it as well. It was the uh, the live experience of seeing it, like, with Adam was really, really cool, and then also seeing it in a packed house, um, kind of really added an extra element to it because we were all seeing it for the first time. Oh, yeah. I mean, and, and, and that is the kind of movie, and it's a real shame that they don't make, like, you know, Adam had to fight to go do this tour and, you know, travel around to get this sort of into theaters where they could be an experience of that level versus, oh, we're going to open for one weekend on 10 screens just so it has a higher rental on VOD, and there's really no one in the movie theaters doing those particular things, giving, making it a tour and promoting it and knowing that Adam is going to be there and there's going to be uh, Q&A and there's going to be um, some, you know, exclusive merch available, et cetera, et cetera. Made a real event out of it, but at the same time, that's like a popcorn movie that offered a lot of laughs, a lot of moments, and, you know, uh, if you're into horror, it offers that because, uh, so there's a lot of elements to that being something with seeing it in a group and seeing it live is actually making it seem that much more enjoyable. Yeah. You know, if you're watching that with one other person, like by yourself, no matter how big your TV is, 80 inches, it's just not the same experience. Things like that are definitely uh, really made to, to, they're catered to watching as a group so that everyone feeds off of each other, especially in the comedy moments and stuff, you know? Yeah, there's some, some pretty big payoffs. And I think that's right. that's what what I loved about it. Um, let's let's jump from you know one hardworking director to another. Uh, well, let's talk about uh, Bloodcraft a little bit and and working with James. Um, how, yeah. how how was that, and how did you get involved with uh, with Bloodcraft? Well, now my history with James is uh, I, and the same with Adam is a little cloudy because I never remember how I even met people. Honestly, I'm not quite sure. How I first met James, I know that my, you know, it was years ago. I was friends with these, both of these guys for many years. Um, and so James and I were socially friendly. Uh, went out and met with him a couple times, drank at a bar, ate some late night tacos, um, knew that he was, um, uh, was a prolific filmmaker in the sense. I mean, this guy, for such a young age, has made so many movies, and I mean, he's cranking them out two or three a year. Um, I don't know when he has time to sleep because he writes a lot of the stuff as well. So when you're writing it, and you're reading it, and you're producing it, and you're directing and editing and sound design, it's like overwhelming how much time he puts into his, you know, time of his days. I'm saying he goes to just work and workaholic. Um, so I know anybody like that I want to work with. Yeah. Um, and so, I've actually, I had a pod, I have a podcast that I do occasionally, and so he had a couple films come out, I think it was, um, Destiny maybe, and, you know, interviewed him with my podcast, and interviewed 
some other actors that were in there. I think that uh, that particular one was Tom Green, maybe, or something, and uh, had him on my podcast. So I promoted James's movies as well, and eventually he just called me on this, and um, I'm not quite sure what made him think of me, uh, only the fact that he, you know, with this Reverend character, he knew it was dark. Yeah. Dark and demented, and was like, I think you can pull this off, dude, and I, I would love to see you. But I think what James does is he think about he he does like to give actors the opportunity to do stuff they haven't done, uh, only so that he can uh, he can enjoy watching them do something they haven't done. You know what I mean? He likes challenging actors on on set, and so he enjoys being a guy that can offer that up to actors. You know, yeah. uh, give them opportunities, and so when, so it's kind of the opposite. Couldn't be more polar opposite than Victor Crowley because Victor Crowley was Dave. I wrote this role for you, and then you look at Dylan, and you go, "Man, that is Dave Sheridan, um, you know, riding at ten speed. He, this is he is in, um, you know, the shallow end of a pool that where he knows how to swim already. You know, it's like that was Dylan. Uh, uh, well, I didn't. Now another actor could do that on autopilot if they are so familiar with what they do, but. But with me, it's like, okay, I'm going to... Dylan from Victor Crowley's in a world that I know so well, I'm going to blow it out of the water. I'm going to bring it, you know, I'm going to take it to 150. Uh, turn this up to 11, so to speak, Spinal Tap wise. Now, the other one, the Reverend, in, um, in uh, Bloodcraft, Bloodcraft yeah. it's completely the opposite. It's like, hey, Dave, I'm giving you an opportunity to do something that you have not... You know, people would say... Oh, Dave Sheridan's not known for that. Uh, this isn't what I've seen him do before in this kind of way. So it's much darker. It's a little uh, creepier for sure. Um, and it's certainly more dramatic on certain levels. Uh, there's also tinges of Dave Sheridan there, especially with the opening scene as being this, you know, the kind of like um, the, the shystery reverend guy. You know what I'm saying? It's like a brimstone in hell fire sort of guy at the beginning, but then he's, you know, he's smoking out front, and he's stealing the money that people go in, right, you know what I mean, so yeah. that's obviously Dave, it starts off a little bit more, like when you first see that, you're like, okay, you kind of hooked in a little bit on, all right, what's this character about, but then it takes a dark turn pretty damn quick, yeah, yeah, like, holy crap, this guy's a, uh, you know, guy deserves to be killed, um, and eventually he does twice, I guess. So, uh, but, so it was completely the opposite because he's giving me a call saying, I want you to come do something that might, you might not be completely comfortable with, but I believe in you. Uh, but as, but as me as an artist and an actor, it definitely, they're both coming from a point of view of somebody saying, dude, I want you to own this. Take it, take it how you want to do it. Because that's the thing about these directors is they're, they're guys that, and mainly because they're doing stuff on the lower end spectrum of uh, budgets, and they're making what, what but little budgets they have, they're making them look great. Uh, they're both very talented at doing that. Um, but at the same time, you know, a lot of times, you're going to allow the actors room to sort of spread their wings in those roles, you know, because it's not um, a Marvel movie that's oh, this is $250 million, and you're going to act exactly how I want you to act, you know? And as an actor, it's tough to... Um, now, I know eventually some of those people just get used to it. You're doing, like, those Avenger movies, and you're, you're on your 14th one, and you probably are like, screw it, I, I feel so comfortable now, I'm not feeling that overwhelmed by the, the budget and the, the, um, the amount of pressure that's on everybody at that level. But, you know, the ones that get up there and they do it for enough amount of time and they become very accustomed and they become very second nature to be free of pressures at that level, you know? Yeah. So, I don't know if that answers your question, but... No, it, it answers about three of them, so we're, <laughs> we're, 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 we're doing good, man. Um, the, 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 particular, the, the opening sequence that you mentioned, I, I really loved. And then there was another, another sequence that I think uh, Dave Sheridan shined through 
uh, was the, uh, there's a scene, I don't want to give it away too much, but like there's a scene when you're like laying in the, in a bed and, uh, yeah. you, do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. 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 I, I, I absolutely yeah. loved that scene. And, uh, right. when it, when it pans across and then it's in it's like demon guy in. Yes. Yeah. 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 yeah that, 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 that's totally creepy and crazy. Loved it. The, the, um, uh, like you mentioned that this is like kind of different than you would you would take on and uh, I, I definitely agree from from the pieces of work that I have seen you do uh, how how do you get in a mind the mindset to play this this role because it is so far from you as well as it's it's just so far from from most people really yeah I mean here's the thing um, I can't speak for other actors and I know that there's all sorts of um, techniques, and I know there's all sorts of acting schools that teach different, you know. I mean, I, I'm, I, I, I went to Second City. I came up to improv and doing comedy. I did a little bit of Meisner or stuff, maybe like one class and a couple scene study classes, but definitely and I, I, I can't consider myself some guy that's studied, you know, all these, acting techniques or uh, is a true like actor actor that really gets off on being an acting class and techniques and, and you know scene studies and stuff like that so for me uh, relying on I guess you'd call transference uh, you know um, somewhat method acting of just trying to get into that character as much as possible even off set you know what I mean like sit there don't like, oh, even when the camera's off, I can't, I didn't just jump in and go get M&Ms and start telling jokes. Because when you're talking about giving, you know, sort of molestation of young girls and giving underage girls ab abortions in the bathtub and the wife dying, like, you know, it's dark stuff. So you can't just kind of jump in and jump out of it. And this one, because of that, I, and it's not something I'm really familiar with on how to play in that zone, definitely spend more time internalizing the scenes and what's going on. And, and once I found that between camera setups, like, okay, we're going to turn over here, now we're going to go to a title then give me 10 minutes, guys. I would stay in the mood. I would stay away from the other actors and just kind of go and walk away and sort of, uh, I wouldn't say keep thinking of the scenes, but just kind of don't start reading my phone and getting on Instagram, you yeah. know what I'm saying? I would, I would have to stay and just kind of like, okay, let me stay focused. Uh, even if it's thinking of nothing, at least it's not moving my brain outside of where it was already at. Uh, but on the transference level, it's also, you know, if you've got a, you know, the deck scene for my wife dies, uh, you know, it's like, okay, who do I really care about? What, when have I cried for someone? dying or a, pet, a family pet dying or a grandfather or grandmother or whatever um, what you know try to put your brain back in those periods and get yourself into a, a crying zone I think for men or at least for me I can't speak for all men it, that, that crying is not easy for me because I don't really cry you know what I mean I'm like because um, I'm a balls out motherfucking dude you know what I mean I'm not this hashtag me too guy I'm sorry I'm I've been, I've been binge watching all these James Bond movies of late like, with my son. Now we're in the recent James Bond movies. And we started at, you know, Dr. Mayo, and we, moved, uh, we went in order. Yeah. Which is pretty cool. But it's just so funny to see how many sexual assaults, sexual harassment, sexual assaults, and then, and then literally beating any woman that he does throughout the movie. I mean, you could put a montage together. Uh, Sean Connery is definitely the worst of, uh, of them all. You know, I think it, it definitely settles down. And it probably ends with Roger Moore. I don't think the later ones, you know, they're smacking the women, you know, <laughs> just to get their attention, like literally knocking them out or smacking them. Or there's there's definitely them a, drinking, a drinking game in, uh, in, in there somewhere. Yeah, yeah, for sure. <laughs> for sure. Uh, but either way, um, I find it hard for me to emotion to open up emotionally on the crying stuff. I think it's easy for me to get rage or get anger or 
darkness, you know what I mean, and to become an angry drunk or a dark, demented drunk, like, the crime stuff was hard, and I definitely have to think about it. I think I've, I've, I've had to spend a long time to prep for that, you know, like, on my own, you know, sitting in a chair, you know, off set, off to the side of set, not like, you know, I mean, I gotta go sit in my car, say, <laughs> you know, go put, put, put on uh, whatever, go play, you know, listen, I don't have to do anything like that, you know, but, but I did have to get, get it working, get the tear ducts working, because, because I don't really tend to cry too much, only because, uh, you just get over it, you reach a certain age, I'm old, man. I don't want to give my age away, but I'm 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 in that middle age, more than halfway through my life. I'm at that part where I'm a little nervous about. I think men, more than women, get kind of emotionally uh, tapped out on all levels. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. They, like you, as they become old men, you know, I'm talking about the old men, now, especially on the funny side. There are not a lot of old, funny people. You know what I'm saying? Like, some of the funniest guys that I knew, like the funny comedians, then they're not funny anymore. You know what I mean? It's like, and I'm not, I don't want to point people out. I'll throw a couple under the bus. But, like, Chevy Chase hasn't been funny in a long time. He's kind of a bitter person, but I, you know, of late, of what I've seen. You know what I mean? Yeah. You know, there you seem to have stayed funny. But then, you know, I haven't seen him too much uh, lately, but, uh, but, like, somebody, like, but it's very rare that there's a George Carlin or a Don Rickles or, or even a Rodney Dangerfield that, at an older age, are still, like, really, like, hidden, uh, sort of, like, have, have life on a lighter side, you yeah. know what I'm saying? And I think that's what it is, life weighs heavier on you, you know, you get to a certain age, then your parents die. And then you've gone through divorces. You've raised kids that didn't turn out the way you wanted them to turn out. They hate you. You know what I mean? It's hard to be funny. <laughs> you know, you know, you know, you know then you, you know, you're looking back at the world and going, oh, the world, the world is going to hell. This is what I, the way it was when I was a kid. And, you know, oh, wait, now I'm a socialist. Now I'm a racist. Now I'm, you know, we've moved the goal line. Yep. You know what I mean? Uh, it's like, I remember growing up and it's like, you know, my grandfather was like, oh, the, oh that, that colored fellow over there. And I was like, how oh, is they colored? I think that's a derogatory term now. But it wasn't when he was growing up. He's like, you know, when I grew up, it, uh, oh, that black guy. It's like, oh, you know, some people would say, you say black, it's African American. You know, it's like, wait, wait, they were black when I knew them, you know. Or, uh, so I think some of this, the like, moving of the goal line may make some of the people, it's, you know, it, it, may, it, it puts them on the side if they have to change. You know what I mean? The way they were. It's like, wait a second. What was so wrong with that? I don't know. I can't, I'm not going to speak to it either way, but I'm saying I can understand how some people, when they get to be 60 or 70, and somebody says, well, now he's an old racist. Yeah. You know, now he's, a, now he's a, an old uh, misogynistic man. It's like, well, but I think that's the way they did, you know, treat women growing up. When, you know, it's, hard. it's our whole thing of how they were brought up. And then it's tough. The uh, to kind of touch on. By the way, we just veered off on a whole other different stuff. You just you don't need to play any of that stuff in. That has nothing to do with the film. <laughs> oh, good man. I, I'm I'm thirty. I'm thirty two, and I, I go. I, I lately I've been going to just as many funerals as I have weddings, and so that's okay. It's it's equally depressing in both in both scenarios. Yeah, but you're not going to funerals of friends, are you? Uh, you're going to funerals of older older people, right? Older, 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 people, people. older people lately, but yeah, I mean, like within the last couple of years, I mean, there's been friends, you know, here and there, but I mean, they're just like random occurrences. Yeah, yeah, so. it's kind of interesting you see that. I do think that there is this kind of like mid thirties first check in of some people die by accident, some you know, some people die from drinking and pills. By accident, I'm talking car accidents, though, too, or something. And then there's, then there's people, like, I had a couple friends that did get sick. You know, like, oh, she got leukemia. Like, there are people like, so you do, there is some shedding of some, some people. And then we've got, you go through your weddings, and then you're going to go through your, all oh, my friends are having kids. Then you're going to go through all your friends are getting divorced. Yep. So, <laughs> so well, it, it's like, you kind of, you kind of like, I don't know, you kind of mentioned, you, you touched on it a little bit. It's, it gets to that point where like, okay, I'm tired, like, 
I'm, I am personally, I'm tired of kind of going to these events just because, like, I don't really have much more to give as far as, as, as emotion, and, like, it's just so frequent. Like, there's, like, okay, I gotta be happy today, I gotta be sad today, I gotta be happy today. So I, I really appreciated you opening up like that, because it's, it's very, it, it hit, it hit close to home, and I, I, I really respect that from you. Oh, cool, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> I only really bring it up because it's something I have to think about for two things. One is, I want to be funny. I'm a funny guy. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't, I, I, feel, I feel like, you know, look, this movie, uh, the movie where, uh, it's coming out, I think it's April 9th, we should make sure we post that, like, uh, and I'm sure you're going to put a trailer or something, um, but Bloodcraft, I really, I really, I really think it came out pretty cool. It's a very interesting, very interesting film, you know, um, um, it's certainly interesting from the perspective of something I haven't done. Uh, but the reality is this, I do feel like uh, that making people laugh and smile comes naturally to me ever since I was in kindergarten, preschool. So I definitely would hate to lose that ability because I do feel like that is a drive of, you know, um, for why I'm here on earth. Is, yeah. You know, I, I like to, I, they say that like laughter is the best medicine, so I feel like I am a form of a healer by if I can be put funny out there for people, you know, whatever uh, I do, I, I always want to be able to, you know, unless I'm giving underage kids abortions and molesting them, then that's probably not <laughs> that my time, time to be funny. But uh, I certainly, I would say this, after doing such dark, um, th this was a dark film, it was the darkest role I've ever done, and I did leave the set drained. Yeah, it's dreamy. It was dreamy because yeah, it, I told you there was so much. I had that. I couldn't just jump into it. I really had that sort of. I wouldn't call it method acting, but I would call it transference. And I would have to sort of put myself in the state of mind prior to the scene and try to stay in that zone, and then 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 do the scene in the moment of the scene and embody what was going on in the scene. But there was also other aspects going on in my head of uh, thinking of the time that my dog got hit by a car for the crime scene or what would it be like if my wife died? Because I am married. Like, what would that be like? And think about that, internalize that, and then make that part of the scene. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, uh, and I'm like, man, I'm glad I don't do this. I left so drained, and I left so... Because uh, it does take your tank out. You know what I mean? It, takes, it drains your tank. And I left that, like, like tired and sort of sore, but also emotionally, like, uh, dream, and kind of like, uh, in a, in a depressing, like, depressed, like, like, de depression was filling that void. Yeah. Um, and I, 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 you know, not that I've ever done any illegal drugs, but if you, if you, if, if you ever done ecstasy or cocaine or any of these other things that, like, send your serotonin levels, it, it, it drains your serotonin levels because it blasts it, 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 it basically, when you do certain types of drugs, it, it, it takes your reserves and just, like, gives it a jolt. It, it releases all of that into your brain at one time, and that's where you get all these kind of your euphoric feelings and stuff while you're on the drugs. But guess what? When you, now when you're coming down, and that's where you see coming down, your brain, it can't replenish those hormones, the serotonin and all the other things, the adrenaline and all the stuff that it has stored up in the gland. That's all drained, and so the next thing you know, now you're just feeling depressed and empty and hollow. And I got that same kind of feeling leaving the set every night. And I could see how some of those dramatic actors in the days, the back in the old days, or even today, and I'm not going to name names, but uh, people that you go, well, man, like, wow, he's an alcoholic. Or they, I didn't, you know, I've heard he's got drug problems or drinking problems. And I now I can kind of see how some of that can happen from if you were doing stuff like I just did in that film on a regular basis, I could see how you could go home and want to like drink half a bottle every night to help you go to sleep and also need to ease the, ease the sort of emptiness that, uh, you know, your own hormones leaving have left. Um, and it makes you think of like, oh man, like, uh, you know, actors that, you know, like, uh, in Walking Dead, the guy that played the sheriff, like, how many freaking times did that guy cry yeah. and go nuts on a fucking, you know what I mean? Like, that guy acted on, like, level 11 of 
emotional distress every episode. You know what I mean? Whether it's or the wife dying or man, he was crying every half episode. You know what I mean? And and then banging his you know, pulling his hair out the other way. You ever, you ever watch that for Walking Dead? I, I watched the first couple of seasons. I I know what you're what you're referencing because like that's kind of ultimately why I quit watching it was because it felt like I was watching the same thing over and over and over. It's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it felt like uh, you know, okay, it was, the same, it was the same roller coaster ride. Yeah, every really every same. yeah every couple arcs. Like there'd be one arc, and then it'd be you know basically there'd be like a couple. You'd have to go get tickets or something, um, and then you know here we go back to the second you know the next roller coaster ride ultimately. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so I mean, that was just something to bring up is that it was interesting how it. I, I, I did. I look. If people, if if the role is, if the role in the film is is something I want to do, and it's and it seems challenging, it seems great, I will do it. But I, if you told me, what do you like now? I want to do comedies or horror comedies or something on the light fair stuff. Or would you like to do more of this dark, broody stuff? I will, I will take the horror comedy and the light comedy and the, the broad comedy any day over this dark. I, I would certainly give this to other actors, you know, because yeah. it wasn't, I, you know, like I said, I I just left drained and feeling depressed when I was making this movie. And, and you know, art is art and I'll do it, But I, and I'm sure if I do more of it, then it balances out and I can figure out how to get through it. But it did really of like, as I get old, as I get older, I go, I don't want to lose being funny. Yeah. I don't want to lose I don't want to lose enjoying life. And as part of me being funny when I'm trying to be funny or when I'm making people laugh, well, then life is fun for me. And I think when I'm having fun in life and I stay young, I stay young and youthful. And, uh, um, cause I, I do think I look young for my age or I act, I'm, I'm still a kid. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I go scootering and skateboarding and I just, you know, snowboarding. I just like being young. In you life. Stop doing that. If you act old, you will be old. <laughs> exactly. And I think that's why why I was so interested in seeing you like in this role. And I like that about James. He puts people that you like you you mentioned it earlier, so I'll give you full credit. But uh he like like Tom Green, like why the hell was he in Bethany? Uh right. and, like it's it's interesting and I love it when actors do that, like take on a role that they normally wouldn't be you know, thought of first. I mean, you can even say Heath Ledger playing uh, the Joker. That's not what right. people had in mind. And, I mean, he blew that out of the park. And that that's yep. why I think that this is probably um, one of, if not the best film by James, because not only is it his probably most polished film, but you guys, the, 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 the cast, really came through. Like, everyone had a great, um, like performance like not only you like everyone really like you know did their part and uh, like as a as a whole it was probably james's uh you know this is what he would you know want to show to get the next gig because i i, I actually really liked the performances uh, from this particular piece well oh man that's pretty awesome you're saying that because i you know i i haven't watched the entire film yet um the premiere is this Sunday at Man's Chinese Theater in Hollywood, and then there's another screening Thursday, the, or Wednesday the 27th at NoHo uh, Cinefest or something like that, uh, a film festival. And so I'm going to see it twice then, and I can't wait to, like you said, seeing it with an audience. Any 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 time when I can see the movies that premieres with audiences, it's always the best way to see it. So I haven't seen the entire film yet, but obviously I know the film, yeah. I know the script, and I've seen uh, chunks of it, but I haven't seen the whole film yet. Um, however, I've seen a lot of his other films, for, so for you to say you think it's one of his best or a polished thing, that that's awesome here. I would say the big thing that sets this film up differently than his other films is this is a truly independent movie, and, um, and it's James... It's his first in the true independent movie where he's not beholden to investors for a quick turnaround or who already have a, um, a distributing deal in place because a lot of the stuff he's done in the past were already 
distributed. They were already, um, hey, this is the money, go shoot this, and you need to deliver it to us by this time, and here's your boss. Yeah. So we're going to give you a couple notes. There were no bosses on this one um, higher than James. This was, he raised the money, uh, or he didn't raise it, but the money was independently. The money was independent, and uh, there was no, there were other, you know, contributors that were producers and the writer, uh, Madeline, like, uh, is that it, Madeline? Yeah. yeah. Um, in the film. Uh, and it, it, that, the film is loosely based on um, a, some aspects of her childhood, her relationship with her dad and some things that happened. Um, there were some dark stuff that she brought into this script and was kind of using it to work through therapeutically to herself. So, um, so some of the relationship with this reverend and the kids was in actuality some things that she lived through. Um, and so that was kind of dark. But it also, when I knew that, you know, meeting her and talking to her about the script and stuff, it also made me want to do it some justice, you know what I'm saying? Like, and take it serious and give the best performance with, on my side of what I could do, um, in terms of the levity and treating it with the gloves that it should be treated with out of respect. Cause there were some aspects, not the, the whole movie. She didn't kill a, somebody and, and, and bring them back. You, you never know, know man. <laughs> well, that, you know, that could be the part that she was talking about that was real. I don't know. <laughs> but there were other things on the personal side. She was saying, this, things like this did happen to me growing up and I'm working through it. And this movie helped me work, you know, writing it helped. It was kind of a therapeutic way of working through it. So that right there was like, oh, that's deep. And okay, I'm going to, I'm going to be respectful here, you know. Yeah. Not that I wouldn't be, but I'm, she's on set. So I didn't want to like, do anything during the take that made it seem like I was making light of it after, right, as soon as we wrap or something like that, you know. Um, so we're kids on set. Um, and I've acted with the one girl now twice. Uh, um, I'm drawing blank on her name. Um, the blonde hair. The blonde hair. The younger girl. Shoot. Oh, whatever. Yeah, I, I can look I'm looking. and tag it. Let's see. Yeah, we're right. in the small. It was that. I'm pu I'm pulling it up right now. Let's see. I'm sorry, it's taking a second. Uh, let's see. Sorry. God. Uh, Anna Hare is that is that the one? Yeah, Anna Har. Yeah, yeah, Anna Har. Yeah. So. I um, I'm actually in another film with her, um, with James Hong from Big Trouble in China. Yeah. And that, that was, we just put it in the can in December, so maybe, um, this time next year, we might be on the phone talking about it, but she's great <laughs> in it too. Um, but that was just by coincidence, you know, like, it's like, oh my gosh, like, I'm working with you again. Like, it's, it really doesn't work with minors that much, where it's like, now I'm working twice with the same girl, and, uh, but it's, it's and, and actually, Zach Ward directed this one that I did, and he's worked with James on stuff, you yeah, know? Yeah. Um, he worked on Bethany and, and Restoration. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So it's like, you know, and none of that was related, actually. That's what was funny about it. They just, because I knew Zach Ward from doing conventions and just on the acting side of thing, uh, uh, through like Tyrese. I met Zach first through Tyrese from, um, like it was going to a Transformers party, you know what I mean? Like a screening, uh, like premiere Transformers party, and then Zach was at that party, and we hung out, and next thing you know, I saw him at a convention, and he's there for signing for you know Christmas story, and I'm like, oh, that's right, a Christmas story, and you know, we just became friends. Yeah. And then he's making this film, and he calls me up, and it's just like, oh my gosh, you work with James, and I just shot a movie with James with. Without Anna, and now you've cast Anna. Yeah, um, because I think she was in Bethany. Yeah, she was in was... she was in Bethany and Restoration as well. So right. J James has used her I multiple mean, so, times. I knew Zach and I knew James. I like met them together. You know, there was no working relationship with them together yet. Gotcha. I think I'm losing you. Are you you still there? 
No. Okay. Yeah, I'm here. I'm okay. Here. Excellent. All right. Well, that that was a a, a nice note to kind of to kind of wrap up uh, Bloodcraft. Um, I I have I want one more thing from you if you don't mind. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I just recently revisited it, and you are you probably are the main reason why I do rewatch this movie, and I'm always looking forward to your your scenes. Um, it's Ghost World, and okay. As soon as I saw you even in the trailer, I knew I had to see that film. Um, is is there anything interesting that you can recall from from that set, or is there anything you'd like to mention about it's that? Not. Well, that brings us full circle back to. Richard Linkletter in the Demo Therapy movie. Yes, <laughs> perfect. So, remember, I told you we were making the Demo Therapy movie, and it was cast, we're building sets, and uh, we had locations and everything like that. We're a couple weeks away. So, that character was the lead character in the Demolition Derby movie. Oh, man. I need that movie. <laughs> I need that movie <laughs> made. Doug, Doug was the lead character fixing up his, this crappy car in the yard, and um, he ends up, it's a Chevette. He, taking, he was going to take a Chevette to a Demolition Derby because that's all he could afford. He had this Chevette. And, uh, anyway, long story short, I told you, it got shut down. Yeah. The movie got shut down. And so different things that, uh, um, so when it got shut down, and Terry Zweigoff was attached to direct it, but he was also directing uh, Ghost World. Um, and so with Dan Klaus, and they knew each other from Crumb, from the documentary when he did Crumb. Yep. And um, that's how Mike Judge was involved with Terry Zweigoff because of Mike and his animation, his drawings, and Crumb you know, and uh, being cartoonist and stuff like that, and game class and the comic books. So basically, um, when it was shut down, Terry's like, keep keep the mullet, keep the mustache. We're going to put you in Ghost World. We're going to find a place to put you in. we got to find something for this character. we got to find something, right? Yeah. And so those scenes were completely improvised. They were not scripted. And it was just sort of the day he wanted to come, and we're going to put you at this convenience store. You know what I mean? Where, where, this, where Brad Renko works. We'll put you as a guy hanging out there in the parking lot. Let's just come up with stuff. And so we just really improvised all that. And, um, but in, in, it kind of speaks, when I tell you all that, it probably makes sense to you now. That when you said you saw the trailer or you saw the thing, you went, what the fuck is that? Yeah. And then you watch the movie and it kind of is this weird thing of like, this guy pops so much with energy and indifference with the rest of the film. And that's why, because it, it was not organic to that movie. It wasn't organic to their vision or whatever. It was, we took this character I was going to do and just said, screw it. Let's put him in here and just have fun because, because. You know, I didn't get to make the movie. I didn't get to make the movie where that was the lead character. We, I wrote it. I spent five years writing the goddamn movie and all this stuff. And so it was kind of a consolation prize where Terry's like, well, let's just go put him in here. And the best part was when that film came out and the, the response that people had to the character, Doug, in the movie. Yeah. Then Harvey, Harvey um, and Bob Weinstein called me and apologized for not for shutting the movie down. They oh, apologized God. what they thought. They said, we're really sorry. We got it wrong. You know, we, we should have made that movie um, because they saw now that the character did, that people were responding to the character, you know? Yeah. Because um, that character is based on a short. I made a short back in the, the old VHS days. I made a short about that character, Stuart, and just kind of a day in the life. It was like 10 minutes long, maybe seven. And, um... That kind of traveled around on the VHS spectrum and got to Richard Linkletter, and he gave it to Mike Judge, and Mike gave it to Terry Zweigoff, and it just and that was kind of the, the auspices of them meeting with me and saying, you know, what do you want to do with that? And I said, I got this feature film idea, and then we developed it, and we all wrote it. We, I did the writing, but they were involved. They read it and gave me notes and story ideas and stuff like that. But it took a long time to, to make that film, to get it to the point where the film is going to get made, but yeah. it didn't get made. 
So holy shit. Yeah. So that, and, but that's kind of why it sticks out. You know what I mean? It's sort of why you were like, oh, tell me a little bit where'd that come from? You know? Yeah. So, Damn, dude, that blows my mind. Because that it's it's so crazy that that was the first thing we started talking about too. So, holy crap! Is is the short of it? Is there is that available online or even is the script anywhere that I can find it? Maybe. Um, this is my cell phone. So, why don't you just text me your email and uh, I'll look for it because I don't know. There was there was a period <laughs> when MySpace was around. Yeah, and I think I might have posted it on MySpace, but I don't know if that's even available anymore yeah. you know what I mean um, I do have it digitally there's definitely somewhere there's digital there's got to be digital stuff in. Uh, I put a, I put that out with a collection of all my early stuff um, that I shot in the late 80s early 90s uh, which was that was one of them because I think I shot in 1993 or something like that the 92 the original little thing called Stuart and, um, which is probably, you, know, you were born, you were born at that point, but you were young. Yeah. What did you, you say, 32? Yeah, 32, 87, right? yeah. You were born in 87. Okay, yeah. So I shot that. <laughs> I shot that when you were five. <laughs> you never know me. I was watching heavy metal when I was five, so. Yeah. So, so, but I put all that on a VHS compilation. Uh, because that back then that was VHS. Um, and you you mentioned the uh, James Bond stuff earlier, and I, I wanted to also yeah. me- talk about that. There is um, so I also have a few laser discs. I, I only collect like the weird ones, but um, yeah. back in the day, Sean Connery did some audio commentary on one like a, bu- a couple of his early laser discs, and they're fucking okay. they're super super hard to find because he's drunk in the audio commentary, and he's ta- he talks about doing coke, and he talks about beating women. And it's like, he's like, yeah, you know, I give a woman a backhand, you know, if, if she needs it, she gets it, you know, and, and because of yeah. which that never got transferred to the, to the DVD. So it's like stuck on laser discs. So that's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. It's so funny to watch him. I mean, like it's, I, I, the Roger Moore, I love the Roger Moore ones cause he was, he brought a, a, a little bit more of a sense of humor and, and wasn't completely uh, he wasn't sexually assaulting these women right yeah there's there's two moments of a couple James Bond ones where you know it's like even when there's um hey man you really should you know like you gotta follow that lead but then him and another guy just like he talks to the other guy going like like yeah you women around here let, like maybe we should just get laid first <laughs> what are we talking about like you know I was like didn't see that but he whatever he said I was like that should be the last thing on your mind right now, but it's still like he's so he's so like he's like a sex addict is what I'm saying. Like yeah. he's like he, he's like literally uh, you know, there's there's things he does which are funny, like there's like in this last one where the, I think it was Thunderball or something like that, where the girl chicks in the bathtub and he walks in, she goes, Well, well at least give me something to put on and he hands her the slippers. Right? Yeah. He goes, Here you go and she's like, Ugh right and kicks the tower on her head and wraps it up but that's like, okay, that's funny, quirky James Bond, but there's other ones where it's just like, dude, like, you're literally just like this skeezy guy now on this chick. You should be focused on the crime. Like, yeah. not, like you don't have time now. You don't, it, it's not like you're trying to get information. Like, when I was a kid, I always thought, like, every time you always hooked up with someone, it was always like, he's, do, he's doing it for king and country. You know what I mean? He's trying to get something out of her. Then I watched a few of them, I'm like, wait a second, this... He could have not. He didn't have. He didn't even need to hang out with that chick at yeah. that point in time. There's something going on. You need to be in Cairo. But he's like, whoa, good. The, we had time. The, oh, you know what it was? Was the one that was really creepy? Was did it take place in Italy? I think it's literally the second one uh, from Russia with Love. It's from Russia with Love, and he ends up with these gypsies and all this other stuff and. Just there's a guy, there's like a gypsy guy, like I think they're in Italy. I don't remember. I think they're in Italy. He's just like, what do they call that? Like not codependent, but you know how like, you know like, that kind of frat boy guy yeah. like, that would like you. You know, well we both kind of party racer. You know, it's like it's like Brett Ca- Brett Kavanaugh's buddy. You know, what I mean? <laughs> like like the James Bond in this particular one ran into a ran, ran into the, the same version of himself. You know what I mean? Just even more like, 
were a jerk. Yeah. And they just kind of like, uh, they really like fed each other in a sense. And the team was just like, oh, that, that one got a little creepy. Because it was like the CIA guy, he shows up on almost everyone's Felix. He's not like a, you know, he's not a, he's not a poon hound at all. He's all business, all the time. Whenever Felix comes in, James, you know, we got to go get the thing. But this other dude was just totally, you know, just really, they, the two of them weren't even spies at that point. They were just like sexually assault guys with a badge. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. What's going on? Funny, I, I, there's I, there's this guy that did uh his I think his name's Ari Shankar. He does like these mm-hmm. manipulations of like uh films. Like there's one he did recently, it was like Mr. Rogers if if he was a war vet and um he did one with uh Joe Lynch a while ago. It was like a reimagining of um of Venom and he right. He's done a couple of these, and there's one that's really, really good, but it, it keeps continuing to get taken off the internet because it's like James Bond, if he exi- like if the same Sean Connery James Bond existed now, like if he was still right. like going, and like it's it's so sad because James Bond is like he's sitting in his car, which is like a beat up like old Aston Martin, and like he's like listening to like the police on his like radio, and he's like, okay, I gotta go you know, take care of this crime, and he shows up, and the police are like, get the fuck out of here, Bond, so he, he goes to the bar, and he orders his martini, and he's all, like, disheveled, and then he, like, he drinks it, and then he, like, he hires a prostitute, because he can't, he's so old that he can't, like, you know, throw him around anymore, (laughs) and so he's, like, basically living the same life, but, like, just sad, (laughs) yeah, his nuts are, his nuts are down to his knees now, (laughs) yeah, like, he needs like a Viagra to get yep. up in the first place, and a and a, and a, and a popper or some sort, and he, he, you know. But he has to live. He has to live that world, man. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Excellent, man. Thank you so much. Thoughts on it. Yeah, sounds good, dude. Thank you so much. Take Thank care, you. buddy. Thank you. Bye, bye. Bye, later.